love behavior, love and sex, emotions, political behavior, economic behavior, all of these things we find evidence of things spreading from person to person to person. Three degrees of separation. And so this is kind of fascinating. It almost at this point seems like a regularity, like something that we should be investigating the same way that physicists investigate how fast objects fall to the floor. And so we think there are three possible reasons for why we get these three, um, three degrees of separation uh, in, in each of these networks. Um, one possible reason is that there's just intrinsic decay. And so this is like you take a pebble and you drop it in a calm pond and it's going to ripple out and eventually the ripples are going to disappear because the energy is going to dissipate due to friction. And the analog is if you can remember back to when you were a child playing the game of telephone, if I tell you something in your ear and you whisper it in your friend's ear and they whisper it in their friend's ear, if we do this 10 times, the thing that comes out at the other end is not going to sound anything like what you heard as the first person in a line um, to, you know, amusing effect. And so, so we think that this is one possibility for why we don't affect people four degrees of separation away. Another possibility is what we call network instability. So if you think about it, your friends, they kind of come and go. In fact, in the Framingham Heart Study, the probability of changing friends in any year is about 1%. Over 32 years, it's about one third. But the probability of changing friends of friends is going to be more than that because you might lose the connection to your friend or your friend might lose the connection to your friend's friend. And if you go out four degrees of separation, pretty soon those people that surround you this year at four degrees of separation are not going to be the same people that surround you next year at four degrees of separation. And so you have this inherent instability in the network that might keep you from being able to influence other people. But the, the explanation that we're most interested in is this idea that actually there's something very natural about this, that we evolved to influence people out to three degrees of separation and no further. So there's a, an anthropologist by the name of Robin Dunbar um, who has this theory that we have lived in groups of size of about 150 people for the last hundreds of thousands of years. And the original way that he came up with this is that he took the brains of primates and he, he weighed them, measured them, the volume, weight, whatever. And he compared them to the average size of those social groups. And then he drew a line out, made a nice flat line for most of these primates. And then he looked at the size of human brains and extrapolated from that line. And the number that he got was 150. And he's also found a lot of other evidence that we talk about in the book about why these natural group sizes of 150 uh, are, crop up everywhere you look. So there are Amish people in North Dakota and Canada, for example, that once their groups get up to about 200, 250 people, they split into smaller size groups. So that on average, these Amish groups have about 150 people in them. So if you think about these, these group sizes of 150, if it's a case that you have about five or six close social contacts, that means that you're going to be con directly connected to five or six people. You're going to be connected to friends of friends of about 25 to 36 people. And by the time you get to friends of friends of friends, that's going to be just about everybody in the group. And so if, if evolution was acting on these groups to promote the ability to influence people out to several degrees of separation or to be influenced by other people out to several degrees of separation, there would have been no pressure on people to do it four degrees because people didn't live in groups where they were four degrees from anybody. And so this is a conjecture, but it's very consistent with other evidence from neuroscientists that our brains are really built for social networks. And, and we detail this in, in, in excruciating detail, um, uh, 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 all the different facts that are sort of consistent with this theory when we talk about how social networks are in our nature in the book. And so one question you might ask is, how in the world can we prove something like this? What's the evidence out there that would suggest that the evolution might have acted on our social networks? Well, behavior geneticists for a long time have been using a simple technique called the twin study. And what they do is they compare identical twins to fraternal twins. The identical twins share 100% of their gene variants. Fraternal twins share 50% of their gene variants on average. And so if the identical twins are more similar on a given trait, than the fraternal twins, then what that suggests is that genes are playing a role in that particular trait. And so we were able to measure three different social network characteristics. It's very, very simple. One of them is how many people name you as a friend. Right, so before we studied social networks, you probably would have just called that popularity. right? 
And as it turns out, when we use this twin study method, the number of people who name you as a friend, variation in that between people can be explained by genes. In fact, genes explain almost half of the variation. So that's not necessarily too hard to understand because, for example, there are people who have extroverted personalities. There are people who have different kinds of faces that make them more or less attractive to, to other friends. And so that, that kind of makes sense that we would get more or, or less uh, nominations of friendship from other people given some physiological characteristics that we have. But we also found that centrality was heritable. And centrality is how close to the center of a network you are, you know, how much you're Bernie Madoff in the telephone tree. Are you the life of the party or are you on the periphery, one of the wallflowers? Um, that's also heritable. And even more strangely, a property we call transitivity is heritable. And transitivity is the property that if two of your friends are also friends with one another, then you form a triangle. And the more triangles you have, the more transitive your relationships. And so if you think about the examples we had before, those military squads, they're all densely interconnected. Those are very transitive relationships. And so here, again, we found that this property is about 50% heritable. Now, now think about that for just a second. What that means is that your genes have an impact on whether or not two other people are going to be friends. And so to us, we think that this is some of the beginning evidence to suggest that our physiology is actually playing a role in the structure of our networks because our genes are not just influencing ourselves. And geneticists are no longer going to be able to take this view that we're all Robinson Crusoe, that one person's genes only impact the outcomes for that particular person. Now, the next question that we wanted to ask in the book is, is how are we dealing with these natural social networks online? You know, so if you came thinking that this was a book about Facebook and Twitter, um, you're not exactly right, but we do talk about how we've become hyper-connected and how we're taking these natural social networks online. And so what does it mean, for example, for us to have, on average, 110 Facebook friends? Are each one of them going to influence us as much as the friends in the Framingham Heart Study did? Well, we don't think this is true. We've started to do some research on, on Facebook, and what we've discovered is that everything that we look at to see whether or not it spreads between these Facebook friendships doesn't spread. And so you might think that, well, maybe that just means we don't pass things along in the online world. But another possibility is that we're just not looking at the right people amongst all those people. Because if you think about your Facebook accounts, some of those people are your dear friends that you've known for 20 years that you have a relationship with in real life. Some of those people are friends of those friends. Some of those people are acquaintances. And for some people, those are going to be strangers. And why would a stranger have an effect on whether or not you eat or whether or not you exercise or how happy you are? And so we decided to cut through the complexity and think about how could we find who the influential friends on Facebook are. And one possibility is that if you upload a picture of somebody and tag it, then that suggests that you might have a close social relationship with that person. And so if you think about your own Facebook page, if you've done this, chances are that on average that set of people is going to be people you're closer to than the whole set of Facebook friends. And we've actually mapped these. And here what we've done is, is instead of, of measuring happiness, because we don't know whether or not people on Facebook are happy or not, we've looked at their profile pictures. And in fact, their profile pictures, some people are smilers. And some people, like my colleague Nicholas Christakis in his profile picture, not so much. And here what we find is there are clusters in the network, in the Facebook network, amongst these picture friends. And guess how far they extend? They extend to three degrees of separation. So it appears in some of this initial work that we're doing, not just for smiling, but also the spread of tastes on Facebook, tastes in movies, tastes in books, tastes in music, that we get things that spread, but only between these picture friends, these five or six people that we're close to online, just like the five or six people that we're close to offline. And so let me just sum up this research by thinking about some large questions that we address in the book. One of these is, what is the purpose of us being connected? Why is it that we form these interconnected webs of beautiful uh, human groups? Um, one possibility is that this is the way we are meant to be. And that really what we are able to find is that in these social networks, that they're structured in exactly a way for us to achieve what we could not achieve on our own. And it's not just that we're a group of people. It's not that, just that we're more people. 
is that these connections have a particular structure that help us to